The market actually had a bit of a sell-off day today with the S&P 500 down 1.12%. We actually saw a lot of the tech-oriented stocks lower today. Remember, that's been the area that's been leading us up until now. Uh, we do have NVIDIA coming out with their earnings announcement tomorrow, so stay tuned with that. Uh, but we did have a number of stocks really struggling today and even breaking down below their 30-day moving averages. A number of sectors were doing that as well. In fact, right now, the only sectors that are above their rising 30-day moving averages are technology, discretionary, and communications. But since those are the largest market cap sectors, it's making it appear that the S&P 500 is perhaps stronger than it actually is. So we'll get into all of that information in tonight's video. Then we'll get into our trade application example, where on days when the market's down over a percent, I like to sell puts on high quality dividend growth stocks. And I selected one out of the utilities spot today to take a look at. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Z. It's May 23rd, 2023. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to our YouTube channel, get into the description area where you can sign up for our email distribution list. We would also encourage you to subscribe to our channel. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Z. We really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these market outlook related posts. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join us at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And as you can see, I've got the S&P 500 heat map pulled up here in front of us. Uh, and my oh my, we had a lot of red here today. Uh, a rare day where the market was actually down over 1%. Remember, those used to be very regular occurrences in 2022. Uh, this year, they have dried up. Uh, where it almost feels um, abnormal when we see them. And so uh, anyway, uh, this is not something that is uh, strange, or at least it shouldn't feel strange to most of you, especially if you had traded last year. But they do come around every so often. Uh, part of the reason the market was you know, under a, a bad mood here today is uh, we're still dealing with that whole debt ceiling issue. And uh, it seems like they're going to keep uh, kind of kicking the, the can down the road. And uh, of course, markets uh, prefer certainty. Uh, sometimes they even prefer it uh, if it's bad news. Uh, they just like the fact that it is certain uh, as opposed to the uncertainty that comes with not knowing how things will react once uh, a decision has been made. So anyway, we'll keep our eyes on that story. But today, it kind of caught up to the market there a little bit. Uh, there were a few green patches out there of note, uh, you know, some well-known, especially kind of dividend oriented companies. I did notice that dividend stocks seem to hold up a little bit better than the market here today, which is uh, not uh, of the norm here recently. 2023 has been a year where dividend stocks have underperformed. Last year, they were of course outperforming. So uh, today was a little bit of a reversal in that. A couple of the stocks that I've been tweeting about here in the last couple of weeks, uh, Pfizer and Bristol Myers both had reasonably good days. Reason I was tweeting about those is because both of them have fallen so much here in recent months that they have now fallen back into the blue zone on the dividend stair step charts, uh, suggesting that they could very well be in some sort of a value territory for those that are thinking towards the long term. Pfizer had some good news late last week about a weight loss drug, and uh, they kind of roared into the weekend on that news, and they continued pushing higher today for an additional 2% to the upside. So just like that, it's back out of uh, the, the, do, the, the blue dividend stair step area. But uh, it had been there uh, fairly consistently in the last two or three weeks. Bristol-Myers, somewhat similar, just doesn't come with the, the specific news that Pfizer did there. But that's another one of those kind of old school healthcare companies that's really been out of favor here recently and perhaps giving longer term investors an opportunity to kind of kick the kick the tires a little bit to see if that is a, a position that they would like uh, to own that uh, has a longer history of growing the dividend. Speaking of dividends, you'll notice that both Exxon and Chevron had nice days. Of course, those are the only two oil companies on the dividend aristocrat list. Chevron was up 2.89%. Exxon was up 1.36%. Both of them, by the way, have been kind of caught up in uh, M&A uh, activity here recently. 
Chevron, uh, it was just announced, was buying uh, PDCE, uh, which is, I think, like a $6 billion deal, somewhere in that vicinity. It wasn't a huge deal, but still uh, noteworthy enough. And then Exxon uh, has been involved in um, purchasing some uh, some some uh, real estate that apparently is where they plan to uh, mine for lithium of all things. So perhaps kind of going a different direction with energy production uh, there. And of course, uh, both of those moves that we heard here within the last week follow last week's news uh, where we heard that uh, One Oak was going to be buying Magellan. So all of a sudden we're starting to get a bit more merger and acquisition activity there in the oil patch. You'll also notice that both Home Depot and Lowe's were up here today. Lowe's did report their earnings this morning and finished higher by about 2%. Remember, Home Depot reported their earnings last week and uh, closed higher by about 1.5% here today. Some of you that follow me on Twitter might have noted that uh, I sent out a tweet immediately that morning after Home Depot reported their earnings that Home Depot had a 3% dividend yield for the first time since the 2020 COVID crisis. Uh, and by the end of that day, that 3% yield no longer existed because after gapping down to start that day, they had rallied for the rest of the day and have continued to rally in the days since then. So uh, right now that's looking like an area of support, but uh, obviously uh, things can change in the future. So we'll, we'll keep our eyes on that. But that's, those are two other great dividend growth stocks that finished in the green here today. Another good dividend growth stock finishing in the green that we've purchased a number of times in my DGI classes is Broadcom, ticker symbol AVGO. It's a very peculiar company in that it uh, does a lot of rolling up of uh, other tech companies. Uh, so their, their, their strategy very much is hitched to the idea and the ability to be able to buy out smaller competitors, much more so than what you'll find with the typical companies in the United States. And so uh, that company today had uh, a bit of good news when uh, it was learned that Apple will be um, kind of outsourcing some of their 5G chips to uh, Broadcom to be built uh, here in the United States is my understanding. And of course, there's a lot of question marks about uh, how Apple uh, can get their chips from Taiwan uh, if something between Taiwan and China uh, starts to heat up there. So anyway, uh, Broadcom had some, some good industry news here from that perspective today. Another dividend aristocrat in the tech space, IBM, was up about a half a percent. Cisco, another well-known dividend growth company in the tech space, was up about 0.18%. Verizon, of course, a well-known dividend stock as well with a yield these days of around 7% or whatever it is. It's had a, a really tough go of things in recent years, uh, but it uh, was able to manage to, to, to close in the green today by about 0.78%. Uh, we talked about Capital One uh, a couple of times already, the last couple of times I've done this video since Berkshire Hathaway uh, issued their 13F filing, uh, which is basically a way for major uh, institutions and hedge funds and what have you to alert uh, the, the media and others about what companies they're buying and selling. And one of the more surprising elements of Warren Buffett's report here a week or so ago was that uh, they were buying Capital One in the first quarter. So that stock has continued to go up. I think when, when that 13F was issued, again, this was just one week ago, uh, it was a $90 stock. Now all of a sudden, you know, you blink and it's $102. So I uh, got the old uh, Buffett uh, seal of approval or blessing, uh, at least theoretically. Remember, we'll never know if it's Buffett or if it's Ted or Todd that's making the decisions there. But that was a somewhat of a larger uh, position that they put on, leading some to believe that that was actually Buffett's decision himself. So a uh, pretty good move there out of capital one once again. Uh, you do see that Tyson Foods uh, was up about 3% today. Solid move for that dividend growth stock. But again, that company has been so out of favor uh, that could very well just be a bit of a dead cat bounce at this moment. The financials, I would say, probably are the ones where you have the highest concentration of green in addition to what we see with energy. Uh, you had a number of the bigger name financial companies like Bank of America was up about a percent. Wells Fargo was up about a half a percent. Uh, you did have Schwab up one and a half percent today. Um, and then it uh, looks like Zions, which is actually a bank out here in my neck of the woods uh, in Utah. It's a, 
Uh, it's a regional bank that's been kind of caught up in all this regional bank chaos here recently. It was up about 4.6% today. So it did seem like the, the regional banks had a better than average day today after suffering as much as they have in the last couple of months. In terms of red squares and rectangles, I mean, where to begin? There's a lot of it out there. Um, you know, there's uh, you know, one area that catches my eye is the casinos. They had been quite hot. In fact, we owned one of those casino stocks in my top-down trend trading class where we try to focus on relative strength. And now you can see that some of what was once hot is really pulling back uh, fairly aggressively. Notice that Las Vegas Sands was down 6% today. MGM was down 5% today. Wynn Resorts was down 6% today. So a pretty ugly day there for the casinos in the travel space. You had other uh, discretionary stocks struggling as well. Starbucks was down 2.5%. McDonald's was down a percent. Um, so it seemed like, you know, it was kind of more of a, a risk off type of a day where you've got a lot more of the defensive, dividend-oriented areas holding up a bit better, and then you had more of the growth-oriented areas really struggling. Notice that Apple was down 1.5% today. Microsoft is down almost 2% today. Alphabet was down just over 2% today. Uh, NVIDIA was down 1.5%, and if I'm not mistaken, I think it's tomorrow that uh, NVIDIA reports their earnings, so keep your eye on, on that because it's, a, it's probably the most important earnings report this week. There were a couple of companies reporting uh, after the bell tonight that I had noticed that had some pretty big movements. Uh, one of them was Intuit. Uh, of course, uh, TurboTax comes to mind when I think of Intuit, but they, they, know, they own a number of other companies, I think like Mint and uh, a few others there as well. But anyway, that stock was down uh, quite considerably after hours tonight. Uh, also, Agilent, uh, which is kind of a healthcare technology-oriented company, uh, was also down considerably on their earnings here this evening. But those two kind of pale in comparison to what the market is anticipating with NVIDIA. That stock is just massive these days, uh, $758 billion. And so uh, obviously there's a lot of people betting on, on both directions. Some people think it's the bee's knees and it's going to change the world. And uh, you've got uh, AI going to uh, allow it to kind of become a game-changing type of a stock. Others are saying uh, you're completely crazy if you're going to pay the types of multiples of over 100 times earnings for uh, a company of that market cap because um, you know perfect expectations cannot be kept forever. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that one shakes out. Keep your eye on it tomorrow. I'm not sure if it's before the bell or after the bell, but I would venture to guess it's probably after the bell tomorrow. So uh, put that one on your radar there. Um, in terms of other areas, um, you know, it's again, it's kind of hard to pick and choose. I would say that the industrials look like they were largely lower today. Notice the consistency of the red in the industrials area. So that one didn't fare so well here today uh, either. So more red than green for certain on a day like today. It seemed like the, the, the bears who were hibern hibernating for a while had kind of come out to play once again here today. Let's go ahead and pop on over to the main part of the platform now and you can see that 111 stocks managed to close in the green today. Uh, that's good for about 22% of the index. So I suppose that makes about sense in my head uh, in terms of you know what sort of a market give back we had today uh, of over 1%. I do think there was a little bit uh, more heaviness towards the mega caps today. So perhaps this 111 is a little bit better than you would have assumed otherwise, uh, but it's in that general vicinity. I, I wouldn't say that that's a kind of an oddball day or anything like that. You definitely had most stocks in the red here today, including those uh, magnificent seven, uh, as uh, David was saying uh, today. For those of you that don't know, uh, David had the opportunity to be on Fox Business today uh, with Charles Payne. Some of you might have caught that. I tried to tweet it out right as soon as I found out about it, so that way it gave you five minutes to, to, to check it out if you could uh, you know, pop on the television. Uh, but anyway, uh, David did a great job representing market scholars there to a national audience, and that was one of the topics that he was talking about was the magnificent seven and those seven mega cap companies uh, that have been really carrying this market here more recently. So today uh, was a broader based give back. It wasn't just those seven that were pushing the market around. It was supported by uh, the armies uh, behind the generals today as well. Moving on over to our charts now. 
you can see that I've got uh, chart 6D pulled up here in front of us. I like to start with this chart whenever the market moves either up or down by a percent on that day that I'm scheduled to do the video. Remember, I typically do the videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we haven't had a whole lot of 1% uh, down days um, here in recent months, but interestingly enough, the few sporadic days where we have had it, uh, I have usually been the one doing the video that day. So uh, I'm at least thankful for that because many of you know that on 1% down days, I intentionally go out of my way to look for stocks to sell puts on. Uh, I like the concept of doing it on sell-off days because you get a slight advantage when volatility rises. Of course, you're taking on a little bit more risk as well, uh, but as long as there are companies that you want to own anyway, uh, then you might as well do it when volatility is a little bit higher than when volatility is a little bit lower. So later on in tonight's session, of course, I will share with you what that trade application example was and just to to, 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 to you know, spoil the surprise, uh, it was a sold put, and that probably was not a big surprise to most of you, especially those of you that are premium members of Market Scholars, because of course I've already sent out the trade details of that when the market was open. But here's what this looks like, kind of in the middle here, uh, where you're, you know, kind of getting a sense as to how volatile, if at all, the markets have been lately. And if anything, the markets have not been volatile lately. Uh, for instance, compare the size of these bars, kind of where I'm circling with my mouse off into the right-hand side. So look at the green bars and the red bars. And then compare the size of those bars to, let's say, this time period right here, kind of in the middle that I'm circling now. And you can see, obviously, these bars here in the middle are exaggerated compared to what we've been dealing with here more recently. We've had very slow trading here in recent weeks and months compared to what we had to put up with last fall when volatility was very aggressive. You can see down below here, this purple line basically represents the pathway of the VIX as well. So the VIX closed today at pretty much 19, as you can see from this number off to the right-hand side, or you can just read it in the label right there. Uh, but that would be another way to kind of judge the volatility if you didn't want to just eyeball these uh, bars and, and how either tall or low they were. Uh, notice that the volatility right now is you know less than 20 whereas over here in September and October it was up here above 30 so um, it's not just your eyes fooling you if you're thinking that it looks like these bars are a lot smaller than these bars they are and the market reflects that as well there just has not been a lot of volatility here recently uh, and when we've had the few moments where we've had that above average volatility oddly enough it's been um, to the upside. So it's been a, a bullish feature, not a bearish feature. In other words, if you look at the blue horizontal lines on the chart here, there's one up here that is associated with the green bars, there's one down below here that's associated with the red bars, those blue lines represent a 1% price move. Of course, the one on top is a 1% uh, plus type of a, a move, or in other words, a bullish day. Uh, the one on the bottom is a 1% sell-off day. And if you go back over the last, let's call it two months or so, I would venture to guess you probably have more 1% up days than 1% down days. Right, so today you can see that this was a 1% down day that we had. Uh, it was minus 1.12% to be exact. But prior to today, the last time we had a 1% down day, we'd have to go back here to May 2nd. So that was already th like, you know, nearly three weeks ago uh, since the last time we had just a simple 1% sell off. Uh, and before that, we would have to go over here to uh, April 25th. And then before that, we'd have to go all the way back here to uh, March 22nd. Whereas during that exact same period of time, we had that candle that was more than 1% to the upside, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and it looks like that one as well. So just you know, eyeballing it here within the last couple of months, you have had more 1% up days than 1% down days. And um, that was quite a bit different than what we experienced last year. So markets have definitely been more stable this year as you know, it, it doesn't feel like um, inflation is nearly as big of a surprise here 
uh, all of a sudden as it was like last year, right? Last year, there were still a lot of doubters out there. I mean, after all, we had been conditioned to expect interest rates to just keep on going lower and lower because most of us in our careers, uh, even myself, who I started trading back in January of 2000, uh, during that entire time period, the interest rate environment had been going lower and lower and lower for the most part because inflation was under control. And then all of a sudden last year, you know, all bets were off. It was a reaction to a lot of the stimulus and things that came out of uh, the COVID policies. Uh, and that just had a crazy effect on interest rates as well, as it kind of seemed like Jerome Powell and company were a little bit late to the party and trying to cool the economy down. And so, you know, last year was definitely a, a bit of a wake up call and a, a difference compared to what most of us have dealt with during our trading and investing careers. So uh, this year, at least from that perspective, is a little bit more calm. Uh, perhaps some of you don't like that. You know, you see a lot of people grumbling on Twitter and elsewhere that the markets have been too quiet, right? Uh, that uh, uh, we want more activity, we're, we're bored to tears, that sort of thing. And I can certainly understand that if you have more of a trader mentality, you like volatility. It's kind of been the opposite of what we've seen. Notice the uh, pathway of the uh, the candles up above of the S&P 500 and look at how you know um, pathetic that has been in terms of volatility. It's just been kind of grinding its way higher at a snail's pace. Whereas back here you had aggressive moves down, aggressive moves back up, aggressive moves down, back up and so on and so forth. It's kind of been the opposite of what we've seen here in the last couple of months. So anyway, today uh, finally got a little bit of bearishness back in the saddle there. Let's go ahead and now take a look here at our normal four grid. This is chart 4B for those of you that are following along at home uh, with your own premium package. So um, first things first, be aware that despite having downward pressure across all four of these indices today, we still have bearish postures across the board. The Dow is a little bit weird because the Dow yesterday had a bearish posture and it flipped back to bullish today despite the Dow being down today. So remember, all technical indicators do have some lag to them. Uh, and in all likelihood, if the Dow, let's say, sells off again tomorrow, you will probably find that the posture will flip back to bearish tomorrow. That's how close it is. You can barely even make it out with your naked eye, but remember, what is driving the background colors of these charts is what is basically happening with the green line. And right now, with that light green background color, it's basically saying that day over day, today's reading on the intermediate line of $30, or not $30, but 30 spot 87 was slightly higher than yesterday's reading which you know was just a, a penny below that basically. So that's how close it is. In other words, there's a pretty decent chance, um, even if the market's flat tomorrow, there's a pretty decent chance that you will go back to a strongly bearish posture on the Dow tomorrow. So be careful reading too much into that posture change today. I think it was more of a fluke than anything. The Dow's chart actually does not look very promising right now. As you can see, it is pushing down and away from that falling 30-day moving average. Remember, on the upside, the 30-day moving average can oftentimes act as support. On the downside, it oftentimes acts as resistance. So if you believe in that concept, right now you'd have to believe that there is selling pressure within the blue chip index of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It was down 0.69% today. So um, you know the, the Russell 2000 was actually down a, a little bit less than that, but the Dow did fare a bit better than the more tech heavy areas of the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. In terms of the other three charts, you'll notice that they still have that darker shade of green associated with their background colors right now, telling us that we have a strongly bullish posture, not a weakly bullish one like the Dow. And in those cases, it's a little bit more evident. Now, obviously the Russell 2000, a little bit of a different story because of course that thing had been hit so hard during the regional bank crisis because that's where you find a lot of those regional banks that um, it really didn't participate in the rebound since the middle of March. Finally, it's starting to seemingly kind of stabilize and strengthen around its moving average. You can see that the moving average is now 
tilted higher slightly because that green color of the moving average tells us price is above a rising moving average, so that is a good sign. Uh, and it's also a good sign that the green intermediate line of the market forecast technical indicator is about ready to enter the upper reversal zone right now. However, on the flip side of that, be aware that today's long upper shadow is not necessarily a great look, right? A lot of times when we're looking for bullish reversals back to the upside, we're looking for long lower shadows. So for example, back here when it hit its intraday low on um, March 24th, you see how you have that wick below the, 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 the rectangle that represents the body. And that is oftentimes a, a key feature of reversals. You can see it happened to a degree right there as well. It happened to a degree right there at a low as well. So sometimes the opposite can happen. Notice how today's candle kind of looks like the opposite of this candle here on the Russell 2000 on May 4th. So sometimes that's a bearish reversal, not a bullish reversal. It basically means that we had a pretty strong push to the upside on an intraday basis, but somewhere along the way in the middle of the day, the bears started to get excited again and push the bulls back down. And so, you know, not a great look there. We have kind of opposing thoughts from that perspective where at least we're back above the moving average, but because it hasn't cleanly, you know, broken through this horizontal resistance from back here, even though it attempted and failed to do so today, then there's still that kind of nagging feeling that, you know, not all is right in the, in the small cap world, but at least there's improvement. And uh, that's uh, more than we could have said for it uh, a couple of weeks ago when it was looking uh, quite a bit more bearish. So uh, we shall see if we can kind of work and get some more constructive activity uh, based upon um, a little bit more strength more recently. In terms of the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite, our charts here on the left-hand side, um, there is something of note to share with you, which is they possess what is known as a bullish intermediate confirmation signal as of today. And I was a little disappointed because the, 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 the S&P 500 signal actually looks really interesting. Um, it just barely misses on what we would consider more of an ideal form of the setup. Just to back it up a second, because I know not all of you watch these videos every single day, so sometimes we have new people popping in and they're wondering, well, what does that even mean? Well, a bullish intermediate confirmation signal, first of all, is effectively a buy the dip signal. What you're doing is you're looking at the green line and the red line on the market forecast technical indicator. And if the green line is positioned bullishly, it basically means that from an intermediate kind of like trend trading perspective, you have a bullish posture. So that's generally speaking a good thing or, or it, it, it typically is for traders. They, they want to be bullish in the markets, then they want the trends to be kind of uh, in place. Um, now the red line is going to track a lot less data than the green line. The green line you can think of as slow to react. The red line you can think of as very quick to react. And the reason is because they track two different amounts of data. The green line goes back and tracks a lot more data. The red line tracks relatively small amounts. So anytime there's a big move up or down in the short term, that red line is gonna move very, very quickly. Just look at the red line, you know, and maybe I can kind of zoom in here so you guys can see it a little bit better as well. But look down below here how the red line is in the lower reversal zone, and then two days later it's in the upper reversal zone. And then a few days later it's back in the lower reversal zone. Meanwhile, notice how the green line has just been more steady. It does not have as you know crazy of reactions, but you can see that the red line goes up and down from lower reversal zone to upper reversal zone fairly regularly. So um, basically what you're looking for with this buy the dip signal known as the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the bullish intermediate confirmation signal is the green line positioned bullishly, which it is. Remember, another way to identify that is just look at the background color of the chart. If it's green, then that means the green line is positioned bullishly right now. Um, in addition to having the red line in the lower reversal zone on that same day. And so you can see that that was the case here today. It is in the lower reversal zone below 20. But why I said it would just barely miss being uh, a more idealized form of it is notice that the red line is at 4.32 uh, in the label here. You guys have heard us mention before that uh, we kind of think of it as 
the five level and below is um, considered more of an extreme move. I kind of feel like I, I was about ready to say an advertisement there for that retail company, Five Below. So I guess that may be an easy way for us to remember this all collectively. So Five and Below uh, is what we consider to be extreme. And sometimes when there's an extreme push lower, then it can drag the rest of the lines lower with it. And so ideally where we would love to see the, the red line is somewhere below 20, but above five. This one was so darn close, you almost want to give it the benefit of the doubt because, I mean, 4.32 is not that far away from 5. But just pointing it out because, of course, that's something that we have instructed with you guys in the past, and uh, some of you might be looking at it and wondering about it as well. But the other part of it that we sometimes look at, this is not technically part of the signal itself, but it is a way for us to help identify whether some signals are better than others, is by looking at the blue line and where we want to see the blue line is somewhere between the 50th percentile and the 20th percentile. And right now it's basically smack dab between those two things. It's at 35 at the moment. So that is positioned very nicely. And the red line is just a hair off of kind of where we would ideally want to see it. And then if you compare that with what your eyeballs are telling you about the chart, you would also kind of maybe get a little bit more interested in the signal because this does look like it is a healthier give back, right? It's not just one of those days. Sometimes we see this signal uh, emerge on a day where the market's down like 0.4% or something like that. And you're thinking to yourself, well, how much of a buy the dips is that, right? Because effectively you're trying to buy the momentary times within an uptrend where the market sells off just temporarily, right? If this market sold off for, uh, too violently or for too long, then your uptrend no longer exists and then traders wouldn't want to be buying that dip. So really you need the, the, the intermediate line to stay in its bullish trend and you're trying to take advantage of these momentary dips along the way that you see at better prices right you just ask yourself the simple question would you rather be buying this at 4200 or would you rather be buying at 4145 well you know all else being equal you'd rather buy it cheaper so rather than buying it when it's breaking out here you're waiting for some sort of a pullback and what's interesting about this and why it kind of makes it you know, a little more intriguing is because it doesn't appear to my eye like you've actually broken a lot of support yet. Maybe that will be in the offing in the future. We don't know, right? No, none of us have a crystal ball. We have to react based upon what we know for certain. And what we know for certain is despite this, you know, index falling for two out of the last three days, we remain a hair above the rising moving average. And then we can go back and say, well, the moving average acted as support during this period of time. It effectively did so with a little bit more undercutting right there on that day as well. And then it most definitely did so on this day when it came down, kissed the moving average, and then bounced right back up you know, the very next day. So you know, it's kind of an interesting setup from that perspective. Now, obviously, our minds can play a lot of tricks on us, and people are oftentimes unwilling to believe what their eyes see uh, you know and, and part of that is because we tell ourselves little stories like the market's overvalued and you know the the, the US government's going to default and you know you get all these demons in the back of your mind telling you why you shouldn't act but if you were just looking at this and maybe it'd be helpful if you forgot for a second that this was the entire market of the S&P 500 and if you saw this chart as a one-off chart in an otherwise bullish market for the overall market would this be a chart that you would be interested in taking bullish action on, right? And you know, if you kind of play that head game with yourself, some of you might come to a different decision. I think part of it is just we've been conditioned to believe that the market doesn't deserve to go up, so we're not willing to believe our eyes when you know the evidence suggests that there's a reasonable chance that it could. So that's kind of interesting about this as well. But you know, just to confirm, price is still above a rising 30-day moving average. We were down 1.12% on the S&P. 500 a day, and it does have a bullish intermediate confirmation signal. The NASDAQ um, was the day's worst performer. Again, that makes sense, you know, talking about like Alphabet and some of those were a little bit bigger sell-offs with those tech companies here today, which is a little bit of a role reversal since those have been the ones that have been leading us for quite some time. And so that's going to have a bigger negative impact on the NASDAQ on a sell-off day. So it was not a surprise, at least to me, that it was the worst performer today. It was down 1.26%. But similar conversation as to the um, S&P 500, if I maximize this here, 
you can see that we do have a bullish intermediate confirmation signal here as well. The blue line is positioned where we want it as well, but we've got the same problem on the red line. It is below five, so it's a little bit more of an extreme one. Um, however, when you look at how aggressive the buy-in has been on this one and how far away we are from the moving average, it gives you the same sense that I had mentioned a moment ago on the S&P 500 that we have not yet broken any sort of legitimate support areas. Uh, if anything, this got a little too far ahead of itself. I think I, I used uh, the word parabolic when describing you know, a chart or two the last time I was with you. And we were talking about how we had this overbought cluster signal there on the NASDAQ that we wanted to be aware of. So no surprise, two out of the next three days, we've given some of that back. We could very well give back more of that. But again, as long as this remains above its rising moving average, I think I want to give it the benefit of the doubt. Uh, back here, you had a couple of test points where it was successfully holding that bullish after a little bit of selling um, but you know with this one up still with this air pocket between where it's trading now and where the moving average is there could still be a bit more damage there it might feel worse than it actually is and the reason is you probably didn't deserve to get those types of gains the way that you did when things were just out of control to the upside so it might make it a little bit more painful when it gives some of those moves back here in the short term but again same thing you do have a bullish intermediate confirmation signal there on the NASDAQ as well. All right, let's go ahead and pop on over here to the internet. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support us on these presentations. Remember, we do them free of charge. We don't make money doing these videos and they do soak up you know, about three hours of our day. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that our time is being well spent and it's not just being wasted. So it wouldn't do either you or us any good uh, if uh, the time was not well spent. So uh, in order to uh, kind of vocalize or uh, you know, send the message, I guess would be a better way to say that, that uh, you believe our time is well spent doing these free videos for you, we simply ask one easy, Thing for you to do for us, which is to click like for us there on Twitter. What that allows for is for us to get the word out about our business to a much greater audience than we would be able to on our own because every time you click like, then it goes into the old Twitter algorithm and every time you hit retweet, it goes onto your timeline. So then all of your social network will see uh, our information there as well. So we figure, hey, if this is a good way for us to you know, promote our own business um, and at the same time give you um, some fairly decent education for free uh, that it is, uh, you know, you scratch our back and we'll scratch yours type of a situation. Some of you may disagree with that, but that's okay. We're the ones running our business and you're not. So in the end, uh, we'll have to make the decisions what we feel is best for uh, our business. But for right now, as long as we can get a number of you uh, to help us along with uh, our goals, uh, then we have no reason not to continue to do these videos. So thank you to the 109 of you that did that for me the last time around. As I always say, as long as we're up and over a hundred. I'll plan on doing a full length, closer to an hour long video for you guys the next time I'm scheduled to do it. On the other hand, if you prefer the shorter videos that I do, then don't click like. And if we're under a hundred likes, then I'll just end up doing a 15 minute uh, video uh, that particular day. Either either way I win, right? Because uh, if it's over a hundred, then uh, I'm getting extra promo promotion for the market scholars business. If it's under a hundred, uh, then I get to save myself some time and maybe even get the chance to eat with my family on, on on Thursdays and on Tuesdays, which oftentimes I don't get to uh, because I'm going to be uh, in the middle of uh, recording these videos. So either way, I'm happy. So in the end, you guys do what you feel is best. Do you like the longer videos? Great. Click like for us. Help promote our business. Uh, if you don't like the longer videos and you want to keep it short and sweet, don't click like. And then uh, we'll all save ourselves a bunch of time and uh, we won't waste your time with uh, you know the additional analysis there. So let's do some shout outs. Uh, thank you to Sanita. Thank you to Sandeep, thank you to Karina, thank you to Ray, thank you to TS, thank you to Arthur, and to Curdy, and to Angelique, and Stock Market Junkie, and Jeff, and El Zulu, and uh, BZ Japan, and Phil, and Kwong, and Eric. Uh, he's one of my uh, buddies. I didn't actually know him growing up, but he's from my home state of South Dakota. He's also interested in dividend investing, so uh, he's a good follow there as well. Uh, thank you to Paul. Thank you to Nick. Thank you to uh, Susan and Linda and Jacob and Cecilia and Lucius and Judy and Dave and all the rest of you. Can't get to all of you now. There's Karen and Ash and Rich. Uh, there's plenty more, but I uh, don't want to chew up too much time. I just want you to know that I appreciate you. Thank you for taking the extra time out of your day to help us along with those endeavors. 
Also, uh, this is what I had mentioned before, by the way. Uh, David had the good uh, pleasure of being on Fox Business on the uh, Charles Payne show, uh, Making Money with Charles Payne. And so um, in, he had done this a couple of times previously, but they didn't actually provide a link for it. So it was one of those deals where if you didn't catch it live, then you're just kind of out of luck. But this time around, you know, Fox was able to um, you know, put it on their website. And so uh, we did both retweet that today. For those of you that are looking for it, just go to our, our Twitter timelines and you'll find it there. Otherwise, I'll read the address up off the top of my web address bar for those of you that want to watch it on your own as well if you want to type it into your own internet browser. It's just foxbusiness.com forward slash video forward slash 6328098. Eight, three, four, one, one, two. So hopefully you got that. If not, you might need to back it up and, and listen to it again. But that'll get you to uh, what they call his hit there on uh, the Charles Payne show today. And he was with them for about four minutes there uh, and uh, gave some of his views on the market, which is really fun for us, right? Obviously, we've had you know some some things here and there to get our, the word out about our business. And as I was just mentioning a moment ago, a lot of it is through Twitter. Uh, but this kind of takes it to another level there when we get a little bit of a national exposure uh, on Market Scholars. So we're really proud of David. He did a great job for us there today. Uh, also, while we're over here on the internet, let's kind of review our sector selector uh, tool here. A reminder, this gets done on Friday night, so it is a little bit stale uh, at this point, but still can give us a good lay of the land here. And you'll notice information technology is back to the number one position. Remember, it had a leadership role back here from mid-March to mid-April, just immediately following the banking crisis effectively is when tech was really leading the way, and then it fell out of favor. Now, one thing to be aware of, and most of you are aware of this, but again, some of you, you know, this might be your first time you're ever watching the video, so you might not know this. Um, so I have to kind of repeat myself every so often as a result, but um, this is based upon an equal weighted system. So this does not give extra extra credit to stocks like Apple and Microsoft and what have you. Uh, I'm bringing that up because this is a time where that would make a difference for better or for worse. What's, you know, uh, what's the right approach? There isn't a right approach. It's just different. Um, but what we've seen here recently is that mega cap tech has really been leading the way. However, we really didn't see the support of the medium-sized technology companies until last week. Right? We had about a month here where the typical technology company was kind of a middle of the road performer from an overall market perspective. But this last week where we saw this green uh, line go from the number six ranking last week all the way to number one is basically telling us it's no longer just Microsoft and Apple that are pulling their weight in the technology sector. Now you're having a lot of medium-sized companies pulling their weight as well. There's tons of software companies and um, semiconductor companies and IT services companies that are now back into some nice uptrends here more recently. So that was a big move. And remember, um, information technology is a wide-ranging sector as well. Sometimes you'll see these really aggressive moves out of like energy because they all kind of move together based upon whatever's happening with oil prices at that time. Technology is not really that way. Sometimes you will find that, you know, hardware companies are moving completely differently than software companies, which are moving completely differently than IT companies, which are moving differently than, you know, um, whatever other one. There's like communications equipment is another industry in the technology area. So um, they're, they're more wide ranging in terms of stock performance. Um, so, you know, it is kind of interesting to see aggressive move. It seemed like last week was a very strange week where technology was really cooking to the upside and the rest of the market was either selling off or just going sideways. It, it seemed like it was the tech show last week and this kind of confirms that to our eyes. Now, in order to get to the number one position, of course, it has to dethrone the previous king. And in this case, it was consumer staples that got dethroned there. All in all, that's a bullish feature of the market, right? We'd rather have a 
growth area like technology leading the way compared to a defensive area like the consumer staples. You also saw that utilities fell off the map there week over week as well from number three all the way down to number seven. So that's another example of defensive sectors falling out of favor. You saw that to a degree with healthcare as well, although there it was just a, a loss of one ranking from number five down to number six. So all in all, that's probably a good thing for the market that de the defensive areas are out of favor and the growth oriented areas have a little bit more interest from investors. You'll notice communication services has also rallied for the last couple of weeks. So it's no longer just a meta story. Uh, we had, of course, Alphabet joining meta here in recent weeks, but it's also some of the smaller, medium-sized communications companies that are starting to pull their weight there, similar to the conversation about technology. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and pop on back on over here to the Thinkorswim platform. And let's do some 12 grid analysis. Starting with chart 5A, this is our asset class, five, our 12 grid. And you can see here we've got a mix of green and pink charts as we often do. Let's start in the bottom two corners. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, uh, the US dollar was up 0.28% today. Uh, you can see that it remains with a strongly bullish intermediate posture. It is also still trading above its rising 30-day moving average. That has been the case for the last two weeks. This has been kind of a runaway freight train there for the dollar. So uh, that, of course, has an impact on other types of investments out there. Remember, one thing that you should assume, all else being equal, is that if the dollar is strong, foreign investments will be weak compared to US investments. And that's exactly what we've seen up here with EFA, which was once leading the market until it got this overbought cluster signal, then it kind of stalled out. We had a pretty ugly day on EFA today. This is the foreign developed areas. So think of Europe, Japan, Australia. Uh, we broke down pretty considerably below that 30 day moving average today. So let's keep our eye on it. We're not in like, you know, uh, you know, a terrible red flag moment because you do still have horizontal support around this level, but you would have sure would have appreciated uh, the, the, the support level of the 30 day moving average holding better than it did. And then to make matters worse, look at how uh, the emerging markets look right next to it. So that would be like China, India, you know, Brazil, that sort of thing. And you'll notice a clear breakdown below the moving average. Not only is it below the moving average again, but the moving average is tilted lower. Notice the moving average color on the developed foreign markets is yellow. Over here, it's red. So that means that price is below a falling moving average here, which is even even more bearish feature. And of course, you can see that the background color of the chart is that darker shade of pink compared to over here, telling us that the emerging markets have a strongly bearish posture with price below a falling moving average. EFA is still debatable where you've got a weekly bearish posture and is below its rising moving average. But both of those are doing worse than the S&P 500 itself. Even today they did. Notice that they were both down about 1.5%, whereas the S&P 500 was only down just over 1%. And if you look at the chart of the S&P 500, it's still got that green background. It's still trading above its moving average. So it is still holding that uptrend, whereas that's still that's that's becoming more debatable in the foreign markets that are out there. So that is typically one thing that you can expect when the dollar has a strong run, which it has had here recently. Another thing that often happens, although today it didn't really happen, but more times than not it does, is that commodities weaken. Uh, gold actually managed to close in the green today, not by much, only 0.12%, but considering today was a strong update for the dollar, you could almost consider that a, a minor win for gold. Now, it has struggled here in the last couple of weeks while the dollar has gone up for the last couple of weeks, so that correlation has held, but it's just today alone where there was a slight difference in that regard. You will see that gold remains below a falling 30-day moving average. You broke some important support areas from a horizontal perspective over here as well. And of course, you got that strongly bearish posture. So uh, gold is a little bit more in that you know, no-touch territory at the moment. If anything, you might be looking at it more bearishly. Oil has held up a little bit better than gold because it's kind of moved differently than gold. It has different uh, geopolitical dynamics and things like that. But you'll see that uh, oil actually had a reasonably strong day today. It was up 1.5%, but it remains below that falling 30-day moving average. And so until you can get up 
above there and stay above there, you know, you've got to still approach it with with caution in all likelihood. Because over here, you were able to get above the moving average, but it failed, right? Um, it's been a really choppy chart. It's not been a trending chart. It's been choppy to the to sideways. So um, it's hard to trust the oil chart here at the moment. Uh, the ten-year Treasury yield was down a skosh today. Uh, it did close at 3.69%. You can see that the yield or interest rate environment had been raised, had been rising nearly every day for the last week and a half. So today was the rare down day. You finally got a red candle appearing on this chart of TNX. But despite that, because it has been so strong in the last couple of weeks, we still have that strongly bullish posture and you're still above that rising 30-day moving average there. Remember when interest rates are strong, typically bond prices are weak and that did happen here to TLT more recently. But similar uh, conversation, just the, the inverse of it, uh, prices have been down nearly every single day for the last week and a half on TLT. Today was the rare day where it was up. It's the exact opposite of what we saw on TNX. You can see here with TLT, which is the long-term U.S. Uh, Treasury bonds, um, it has oversold cluster signals. Uh, it's had about four of them here in the last couple of weeks. So you would like to think that there's going to be some sort of a, of a snapback rally. Um, now, whether it actually changes the trend is another question. Typically, I assume that it won't, but I do assume that there will be some sort of a shorter term bounce back towards that moving average, and then oftentimes it rolls over again. So we'll keep our eye on that possibility, but you're kind of priming the pump for that opportunity right now. Um, Let's go ahead and pop on over here. By the way, Bitcoin uh, remains uh, below 28,000 right here and below its falling 30-day moving average. Let's go ahead and pop on over here to the sector 12 grids now, and this will be chart 5C for those of you following along at home. Quite the, uh, quite the difference in the colors here on this one. Remember, sometimes we're in a straight up market where all sectors are benefiting. Sometimes we're in a straight down market where all sectors are struggling. Right now, we definitely have a bifurcated market. And remember, it is the defensive sectors that are intentionally put at the bottom rung of this 12 grid. So you've got healthcare in the lower left, staples right next to it, utilities right next to it, and real estate right next to it. You have uh, strongly bearish postures across the board on all of those defensive areas. Not only that, but you'll notice all of them have red moving averages, suggesting that price is below falling moving averages in all of those as well. Whereas it's not quite as consistent on the upside. In other words, notice that our three most important sectors, remember these ones are market cap weighted, so our three most important sectors to the market right now are technology, uh, discretionary, and communications. And it just so happens that those are the three charts that look the best. So it's kind of artificially impacting how the SPY looks, which is also market cap weighted. If those three can hold up, then you've got an opportunity for the stock market to be strong. If those three get weak, it's the exact opposite. So right now, it strikes me as we're in a moment in time where most of the other eight sectors are actually out of favor, but because the three most important sectors are in favor, it's making it appear that the stock market is strong. Remember, those magnificent seven companies come from those three areas. In technology, we're talking about Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. In communications, we're talking about Alphabet and Meta. And in discretionary, we're talking about Tesla and Amazon. Those are your big seven companies that are basically carrying this whole market on its back right now, and they come from three different sectors. And all three of those sectors are the only ones where price is above a rising moving average. Look at all of the other sectors. Here you can see XLF is below the moving average, which is financials. Here you can see industrials are below the moving average. Here you can see materials are below the moving average, energy is below the moving average, and I already told you that all four of those bottom ones are below the moving average. So the only three sectors are the most uh, important sectors to the whole S&P 500. So there's a little bit more bearishness under the hood than you might assume if you weren't looking too hard. Um, but you know, hey, if if you got to have 
a small amount of sectors, um, you know, uh, bullish, you might as well have the ones that are the most important. So, you know, in this market, beggars can't be choosers, I suppose. But um, just be aware that those three do still look like they're pretty healthy charts, despite the sell-offs we saw today. All three of them remain, to my eye, in an uptrend. And if that changes, of course, I'll let you know as soon as possible. But right now, um, that's what the market has going for it, so to speak, right? When you're trying to put things in the plus column and the minus column, that's definitely something that the, the market is benefiting from here uh, at the moment. In terms of who's today's um, you know, winners and losers were, energy was the big winner. Now remember, XLE as a market cap weighted sector ETF has like 40 to 50% of its allocation in just two stocks, Exxon and Chevron. And I showed you on the heat map earlier in the in the video uh, that those two were up nicely today. So that explains a lot of energy's outperformance here today. So just be aware of that. But uh, it is what it is, it's, it's the truth of the situation. XLE was up over a percent today. It was actually the only sector that was up. All of the other 10 sectors were down and the worst of those 10 appears to be technology. Uh, actually, I take that back. I just spotted materials. Materials here kind of in the middle was down 1.55%. Uh, technology was just a hair behind it at a minus 1.48%. So energy was the best. Materials was the worst here today. All right, let's go ahead and get into our trade application example now. And as I already alluded to earlier in the video, you guys know that on 1% down days for the market, I go out of my way to look for stocks to sell puts on. For those of you that are not familiar with that strategy, it is the ability to generate an income stream by putting yourself on the hook for buying a stock if it falls to a lower price. So think of it as a way to say, hey, I want to uh, buy this company if it falls to a price where you like the dividend yield or you like the valuation or what have you, and if it does, you get to buy the company at that lower price if it closes below the strike price of the option on expiration day, uh, or if it doesn't and the stock goes up, even though you want it to go down to buy the stock at the lower price, you still walk away with some winnings in your hand. And so the stock that I chose for that strategy today was Sempra Energy. This is a utility company. It's a natural gas focused company out of San Diego, California, one of my old stomping grounds. And so those of you that live in Southern California might very well send a, a monthly check to Sempra. Uh, anyway, they do have some exposure to Texas these days as well and have also kind of experimented with exporting of liquefied natural gas across to other countries. So it's kind of an interesting company, um, not your standard boring utility company that's out there. But like a lot of utilities, it's fallen out of favor. Uh, like we talked about here a moment ago on the sector selector, remember how I said that the utilities fell from like the fourth position down to to eighth or whatever it was. I still have it pulled up. Let me just check it so I can give you the real data from number three down to number seven, right? So we see utilities falling off significantly last week. And so back over here to this chart, Sempra is no stranger to a sell-off just like other utilities were last week. Um, and when you're looking at this dividend stair step chart, you see an orange line at the top, you see a blue line at the bottom. And those represent areas of historical importance of where you might be more interested in buying and more interested in selling if you're thinking about things like a long-term investor. Naturally, the orange area at the top is where things have gotten a little bit overheated to the upside where you don't want to be a buyer for long-term perspective. If you're a trader and you're trying to push into relative strength, that's a different story. But I'm talking about something entirely different here. I'm talking as a dividend growth investor myself. I would not want to be buying this stock up here in the orange area because its dividend yield is too low up there. When the stock sells off and goes down, dividend yield goes up and becomes becomes more attractive, eventually to become attractive enough for outsiders to step in and support the stock by buying up the shares where it is offering an attractive yield. So every company has its own unique yield history. 
Sempra is not known as a highest yielding utility out there, so for it, typically, it becomes attractive when its dividend yield is 3.41% or better. And so this dividend stair step line will show us visually where the stock would need to fall to in order to achieve that particular yield, because right now its yield is 3.25%. So this stock would need to fall down here to $139.59 or lower to become attractive uh, based upon the average yield theory that I teach my students at Market Scholars. So what I opted to do here today is I sold the July contract. So we, this will be the first time here in this presentation where we're moving to the July inventory. Up until now, it had been the Junes. So in this case, I chose the July monthly contract and it was the 135 strike. And you can see that 135 is easily into the blue zone here. The stock would have to fall an additional $10 per share between now and the middle of July. And if it does, and it goes down below 135 on expiration day, then you have to buy 100 shares of it if you haven't closed down that options trade. On the other hand, if it does not go down more than $10 per share in the coming month or two, uh, then you get to keep the premium that you received up front. So we got like 150 bucks or whatever it was to sell these strikes here today. I usually target the 1% return on risk area. Today we got a bit more than the 1% return on risk, but we're gonna be in the trade for a little bit longer as well, so we need to account for that. So anyway, if this is a stock that is of interest to you, that has a long history of growing its dividends each and every year like clockwork, and you wanted to buy it in the blue zone, you can't do that right now because it's not in the blue zone, but if you sold the 135 strike and the stock keeps falling, then you can commit to buying it at 135 where your yield would be considerably more than the 3.41% that you would set out to attempt to, to lock down for this longer term position. That's what I had for you here tonight. If you appreciated the video, I ask one simple request. Click like for me there on Twitter. If we're up and over 100 likes, I'll plan on doing another full length video for you on Thursday. On the other hand, if you prefer the shorter videos, don't click like. And if we're under 100 likes, I'll keep it nice and short and sweet for you on Thursday. So until next time, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.